Hey everyone, I'm Stephanie. I'm a book-loving, notebook hoarding, reader and writer on a mission to change lives one book and one notebook at a time. And this is the Get Literate Podcast. On this podcast, we explore the power of leading literate lives. We talk all things books and reading, notebooks and writing, and everything in between to make our lives better. And no matter what better means to you, the pages inside books and notebooks can help us get there. So each week, we'll mix together books, notebooks, mindful practices, and creativity to cultivate a life we love. Now grab a notebook and your TBR list, and let's get literate. Hey everyone, welcome back to another episode of the Get Literate podcast. If you are listening to this in real time, then it is Valentine's week. It is all things Valentine's and love in the air. And so I'm here with a bonus episode talking about the one thing that really lights my reading life on fire, and that's children's literature. I devoured it as a child. I read it religiously for my students as an educator, and now it's something that I choose to bring into my adult reading life as well. And I'm here with someone to help me celebrate my love of children's literature with someone who might know a thing or two or over 80 (laughs) about (laughs) children's literature. And that's James Preller. So James, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm so glad to be with you, Stephanie. Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, I'm so excited. So we recently connected in person, I want to say a couple of months ago at a local children's literature event, now that we are able to meet and gather again, which was wonderful. Before that, we ended up being Facebook friends, right, over our our love of literature and the people in our worlds that were connected. But when I really got thinking about it and thought, when would be the first time that I had connected with you somehow. And I realized it was probably 15 years ago, at Mm. least. Because back then I was a reading specialist at a local elementary school. I worked with kindergarten, first grade, second grade, third grade students who were having difficulty learning literacy, whether that was learning the actual act of reading or learning to love how to read. And your your series, right? The Jigsaw Jones series, they were in my toolbox of, you know, I, I used to joke like like gateway drugs into reading because kids were desperate to move from the early readers, the little readers, and to move into the good old chapter books. And that was a really long time ago. And you have written so much uh, since then. So I'm, I'm so glad to be able to talk about all the books today. But it was it was just neat to be able to connect those dots and go all the way back that far. And so I would love for you to just give give listeners an introduction. I've I've sneak peeked to the Jigsaw Jones series, but tell us about you, who you are, some of your books, and we'll get into a couple of your books. I hope specifically after that. Uh, great. Well, who am I? You know, that's you know, uh, isn't that Alice in Wonderland? You know, who am I? That's yeah. the question throughout. But um, so yeah, I'm trying to answer that still. And and fortunately, as a writer, you get to constantly reinvent that. Um, I was an English major at Oneonta. I went to Oneonta. I grew up on Long Island. Went to Oneonta, and that's when I really first started thinking. I, you know, I want to be a writer. You know, um, or or something. You know that that you know I fell in love with poetry. So of course, upon graduating college, I got a job at Beefsteak Charlie's as a waiter for a year. <laughs> that seemed like the most writerly thing to do. But eventually I, I moved to Brooklyn and got a job. I answered an ad for, I was looking for any kind of job where that they would uh, take into account my that I had writing skills. And I answered a job for a junior copywriter at Scholastic uh, Publishers, who I didn't really, you know, I didn't have, at that time, I didn't have a strong affinity for children's books. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a kid, I was sort of an active doer. I have books I remember, but I wasn't particularly bookish or anything. I've I've interviewed hundreds of authors and illustrators as kind of like a hobby of mine. And I do that um, in various places and on my blog and whatnot. But some of them 
or like they can talk about being six years old and walking into that library and the smell of books right. and the wonder that they felt and the sense of belonging. And I was none of <laughs> I was, you know, stomping in puddles and rolling around in the mud. But um, but there I was at Scholastic and I started seeing like that was the first time I saw where the wild things are and and those books and 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 I had just an immediate connection and respect for the possibilities in children's literature mm -hmm. and of course you know I had hoped to do meaningful work in my life and things that mattered to me and maybe in some small way contributed to the world and that also you know resonated and I felt like you know this is good work here um, that has value so it's kind of, you know, and I published my first book when I was 25, a little picture book, and I've kind of sustained a career ever since. I went freelance in 1990, and um, one of the one of the many funny things about the pandemic <laughs> is that I, uh, you know, for years, since 1990, I've worked at home, and uh, I've, you know, and everybody would always say, oh my God, that must be so hard. I'd be vacuuming all the time. And I'm like, I'm not in danger of vacuuming. <laughs> That's not what, you know, the, the, the kitchen's a problem and distractions from, but, you know, and I, but I was always loved it, but everyone was like, oh, I could never do that. And then the pandemic happened, there everyone got a taste of it. And everyone's like, this is great. You know, I'm not driving to work. I'm not getting dressed and all of that. And um, so I've been, kind of living the pandemic world uh i i was ahead of the curve i guess <laughs> so yeah and um you know i i've had i've written some series i probably you know the biggest thing in 1997 i started writing the jigsaw jones series uh 42 books in all uh they were very popular some of them went out of print then came back into print there's 14 now that are available and everywhere and that opened a lot of doors for me and i started publishing in hardcover in 2008 or so and i've been pretty consistently writing middle grade books <laughs> and other other things so i've just been you know i'm kind of an unusual author in the sense that i've written ya i've written early right. readers and picture books and middle, you know, chapter books. And I'm kind of dividing, you know, middle grade has become such a lump. I'm starting to see and appreciate the distinction of younger middle grade and older middle grade. Cause it's right. such a, you know, that fourth grader and that seventh grader and, and the content are so different yeah. that, um, you know, I'm making that distinction, but I've kind of run the whole gamut and that's probably like a really dumb thing to do in terms of my career, in terms of like a brand or, you know, like there are authors out there, you know, exactly what you're going to get sure. when you pick up, you know, a Barbara D book or something like that. Uh, you know, they're kind of very narrow bandwidth, whereas I'm a little all over the place. Well, that just means you get to grow with the reader, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I'm great for school visits because I can, you know, I have that K through eight right. thing, right. you know. So wide range. Yeah. And let's talk about some of those books, because as I mentioned, you know, the Jigsaw Jones series, that that was the first series that I do of you. And then, of course, diving into your very extensive backlist of, of other books to to enjoy. You definitely have a, a wide range. I just read your newest Exit 13, oh. which truly blew my mind, right? Because I was, I came into it thinking, okay, you know, I, I know middle grade novels. I know what to expect. We've got relatable characters. We usually have some sort of relatable drama, some sibling issues, you know, some family stuff. And, and that was all present in your most recent book, but then so much more, so much more that, that was unexpected to me but just had me riveted. Like I, I read mm. the book, you know, I'm an adult. So I sat, I read the book in one sitting because I thought, what, what is going on? What is going on here? And then I turned the last page and thought, okay, when is the next one? Because, you know, the, it, it had such an interesting spin to it. So I know I probably went from like your first series to your most recent one, not to skip any of them in the middle, 
but that one was just so provocative for me because it touched so many different aspects that I think not every middle grade novel does. We had some supernatural in there and we've got some some fantasy out it it was all the things for me so I'm wondering can you go right to the most recent book and just talk about that one yeah well thank you thank you um yeah the the most recent book is it's exit 13 the whispering pines yeah and um and I love trees and I'm fascinated by trees so um that's trees are finding their way into my books <laughs> all kinds of ways but um you know i think that every book every writing experience has a cumulative quality you know i think like nothing is wasted and you know you're kind of building your your tool belt and your craft with each thing you know even the dead end manuscript that ends up in a folder that no one ever reads that mm-hmm. somehow enriches me as a writer so with jigsaw jones i had to learn how to write mysteries you know simple mysteries but still you know you had to think it through i never wanted uh i always wanted i tried very hard to have a satisfying mystery you know that that wasn't lazy um or that would offend the reader and i also wrote a series called scary tales where i was you know and that was inspired by meeting all these readers who on school visits who just loved scary stories and that's what got them and i have three children and my two oldest didn't care but my youngest maggie uh and it's always you know it's always the innocent looking blonde haired nine-year-old who like is like more blood please <laughs> um, so she, you know there's so i started writing these you know quote unquote horror stories which are really suspense and um, so I kind of got that in my, um, you know, I kind of learned how to write that type of book. And then at the same time, I believe that, you know, realistic fiction is at the foundation of all writing. Like, you, you know, and I love the closely observed, you know, dinner time conversation and quiet books. Like plot doesn't come as naturally to me as I can have three people sitting around and and do that closely observed you know those little nuanced moments and I and I love that as a writer I love that as an observer in life but then I like okay plot you know readers readers seem to like plot they like things to happen and writing the mysteries kind of forced me to do that um, the scary story. So I've kind of embraced plot. And so Exit 13, the idea was uh, Schitt's Creek that, uh, meets Stranger Things. Yes. So it was that comedy, Love that description. lightness of, and the, that setting, you know, the motel setting is a great yeah. setting because people can come and go and I can just have new characters check in. And, um, you know, so it's this mysterious setting and then the stranger things which i really enjoyed those um you know that series on tv especially year one most especially year one where the innocence is still there as they've gotten you know the actors are like 20 i know they're old (laughs) it's kind of yeah it's kind of they're struggling against um their strengths in some ways but um i love the the freedom and the weirdness and the eeriness of uh stranger things so i tried to capture some of that in exit 13 and it's fun you know it's really liberating as someone who is you know so steeped in realistic fiction to kind of go huh let's let's have something a little bit weird happening here uh, i was also inspired with um uh, pet cemetery stephen king's pet cemeteries got a little bit it's a little bit yes. in there too it, it yeah. does. And that's what I was struck by as I was reading it. You know, no matter what kind of kid you are or what kind of reader you are, there's something that's going to get your interest, whether it's, you know, the budding friendships, if that's what you're hoping to get out, you know, friendships with characters, whether it's um, the forest aspect, the woods, the trees, or the idea of, you know, the, the, the motel. I don't want to give it away. I don't want to say kind of what happens at the end, but there is definitely something 
for every reader. You know, even if you just love golden doodles like I do, there's something <laughs> there. Yeah, I had a golden doodle. I had a golden doodle. Um, yeah, yeah. They, and I don't know. It's uh, I love the different characters that came in. You know, there's um, again, you know, when you're writing, when you have that setting, you you know, you can just lean in and and have a new character arrive and 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 deal with. Um, you know, I there's a, a a young girl who's a daughter of our friends. You know. And uh, she just turned 18, Maddie, she's amazing. And she had, you know, was born with spina bifida. And I've always like been, um, you know, moved by her accomplishments and all of that. And that feel, you know, I feel that. And, um, you know, I've always tried to be, you know, inclusive in, in my writing, you know, writing Jigsaw Jones, when you sit there and go, okay, I need a classroom with 24 people you're just going to naturally yeah. want to be representative of the world as, as it's lived. So that's always just been, you know, so I was glad in exit 13 to, even though I'm writing what I think of as an entertainment, you know, like this book is like, I am really trying to entertain the reader and keep them turning the pages. And, oh, yeah. and, you know, I've written quiet stories and, and, or, books where I imagine there's a smaller sliver of uh, thoughtful type kids who who would like to read this. With Exit 13, I'm kind of reaching for a wider audience and just trying to be, you know, just as fun a reading experience as I can possibly deliver. But at the same time, um, you can't help but like have your, you know, soul and spirit and beliefs enter into right. everything you write right there's signals and and messages and everything so i wanted to you know so that that small character i'm kind of proud of that that very small character and how they respond to her and how they kind of don't you know aren't sure can we talk can we ask about her legs should right. we not is it rude do we so there's a little of that conversation in there so i'm always proud of you know there being some depth and content even as you're, you know, eagerly turning the pages, if right. I can pull that off. Yeah, we're learning as we're entertained. Do you find that you write books with, you know, from those little snippets of of your life? Do they just work their way in different ways into your books, like naturally? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I think, um, you know, I and I teach a class for uh Gotham, an online class writing children's books. And we talk about this a lot about, you know, a lot of us, we start with our own life and we have to learn how to fictionalize our, um, our lives, uh, you know, so in, in able to let those characters do what they need to do and, and allowing the story room and breath to, to, yeah go where it needs to go in some ways you know when we get too beholden to our you know the details of our own life then you know soon we're kind of boxed in and unable to to write freely so uh for me you know i'm the youngest of seven children and that's always been like you know the, the longer i live the more I realize that that's like a really central fact in who I am and how I experience the world. So Jigsaw Jones was, is the youngest in his family. I didn't give him as big a family just because that many characters <laughs> is challenging lot. for a reader to just like, what, you know? Um, so that being the youngest and my most, my previous book, uh, Upstander, which is a sequel Yep. prequel to bystander you know the main character mary um she's in seventh grade but she's seeing her older brother johnny going through you know some really serious opioid issues now i don't go, as the writer i just i don't follow johnny in you know in his experiences but i very much hug close to mary and identify with mary's sense of like these older brothers and sisters kind of doing stuff you don't really understand. You know, I remember waking up and like 
my dad and Billy got into a fight and dad had a black, you know, like, like <laughs> what's going on, right. you know, when you're six years old and there's just boyfriends and girlfriends and people climbing out of windows and all <laughs> that. And, and you're watching this going on, uh, getting it. But that observer, that witness, you know, I think is a big central pack fact for me and, and probably has helped me as a writer. Yeah, lots of material to draw from, it sounds like. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I I would love to talk about one more of your books because I, f- I fell in love hard for this one, uh, The Courage Test. Oh. I loved this book. Um, first, I just loved the setup that a boy who is named after Lewis and Clark actually goes off with his dad to explore the, the same trail, the same territory. And of course, lots of transformations and and revelations and understandings and a lot of information for readers about, Mm. you know, what actually happened back then as well. So I would love if you could give readers a little snippet of the courage test. Cause I, I know, I know my listeners, I know we have a lot of educators who are listening and I know this is one they're going to want to get into their hands if they haven't already. Oh, thank you. Um, And by snippet, you mean just talk about it a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Give us, give us the scoop. The scoop with um, <laughs> the courage test. Um, mm. Well, there was just so much about this book. Uh, and I mean, uh, a boy is basically pushed out mm. his door by his mother to spend time with dad. And, and they are a recently divorced couple and there's hurt and there's uh, Mm -hmm. confusion. And, you know, this boy, he just wants to play travel baseball and be home. And he's kind of being forced to spend time with dad. And there's a reason for all of that. And um, can, should I give it away? No, 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 don't give it away. away No spoil, but there's a reason for that. The mother, you know, and, and some of those are, easily guessable kind of reasons but the mother wants uh the boy to spend time with dad and have quality time with his father and um i love the story of lewis and clark i love the journey of lewis and clark and it's funny you know i mean in our world now like i i don't know that there is uh celebrated maybe as they deserve or or should be you know it's just an awkward transitional phase we're going through but they went on this incredible heroic journey across the united states lewis and clark fascinating brought a slave with them um an indian girl sacajawea who had been kidnapped and forced to marry a French dude. Like, you know, so there's all of that there. But um, so I have the boy and his father follow in the footsteps of the Lewis and Clark trail. So I, they are kind of learning the history uh, as they are experienced in real time, you know, their own, their own experiences and i have their experiences kind of echo and reflect and mirror in distorted ways um some of the experiences of lewis and clark so it was kind of a really challenging book to write and and fun and i felt that there was a lot of content in there um and and trying to you know as writers one of the real challenges that we all have and i see it with you know, working with writers a lot is what I call uh, the, the info dump where, you know, you've done all this research, you've learned all this stuff. And then um, how do you deliver that in a story without it just suddenly being like, okay, two pages of history on Lewis and Clark. And I was very careful to kind of string that out in piece in pieces and not overwhelm a reader where like oh my god this is this is too much it was fun writing a road trip and you know like you knew where the book was going to end you know they had to get to the pacific ocean there so that was nice um did you have any questions about it or other things that you wanted me to 
No, I think that was good. That was a great setup without without giving a, a big part of it away. Yeah. I think, you know, it made one other it one other oh. thing, if, if I could interrupt you about that book, was it started. I had an idea that this boy would learn lessons along the way that would then prepare him to deal with something at the end so that I almost wanted, you know, when I first conceived of it, I thought there'd be like 10 lessons, you know, specific ones about resourcefulness and blah, 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 courage and this and that. And that, so he would have this experience that would then help him deal with the next experience. And um, I ended up abandoning you know that in a very strict way but that was still like the motivating idea and i did feel like his journey with his father uh was uh you know it provided a series of lessons uh along the way so thank you for reading that one it was beautiful i i loved it um you know the junior library guild selection so yeah i'm i'm hoping everyone picks that one well, I hope they pick lots of them up, but I, I really, I really fell for the courage test. What I also loved about it though, and this is just the kind of, um, the reader I am, I think, but you also do this in, in exit 13, where you've got exit 13, you have narrative, and then you have these really cool graphic novel panels that are in there for the reader. And what I loved about the courage test is that you had the postcard writing or um, kind of thinking back to, I think it was a school assignment, but you had these little snippets in there that broke up the reading in a way so that you really could feel like what was going on inside of his his head and where he was. Mm -hmm. Um, And I love that. I love that you introduced those additional elements. It really just brightened the whole experience for the reader. Thank you. Thank you. I try to do that. I'm, I'm currently writing a book where I have a character who it's complicated, but for different reasons begins to see her life in play form. So I have certain chapters that are take a place like are written as if they were screenplays and she just kind of experiences her friendship. And part of that is just a sense of playfulness and just keeping things fresh and interesting for a reader. And, you know, but you don't want to do it where it's, just arbitrary and forced, you know, you want it to uh, serve a function, but, but it is fun and refreshing when writers do that and break it up. And I know that, you know, reading a novel is, can be a really challenging experience for anyone. So anything I can do to kind of, you know, throw in a curveball or something is, is good. There's just one other book I want to just mention because I think it's might be uh, better known one of my better known books is bystander where i it was one of the my for i kind of got lucky in the sense that i hit on bullying as subject matter at a time right at a time when suddenly uh there were some national events that kind of took every, got on the radar and every school administrator was like what are you doing about bullying and they're like we're going to read Bystander by James Preller. So it got me all over the place. Yeah. But with that book, what's interesting about that book, I think, is that I've always thought of it as a talking book. And I don't, you know, Exit 13 is not that. But with Bystander, I thought this is a book that in the hands of a good educator in a lively classroom, you know, the book is fine. The book's good but the conversations that can be had afterwards and during and throughout is where the real value is and it was really interesting to you know I didn't I've never really set out to do that again to go okay this is a talking book but I it, it just occurred to me uh kind of later on that that's what it was and um it's kind of an interesting subgenre of, <laughs> of like books that are really good or discussion you know it's not about the book it's never about the book it's about the reader's experience of the book and whether it's you know it doesn't matter what book it is the book's dead until somebody opens it up and reads it and experiences it and you know that's the exciting moment you know and and what's weird about being an author is 
you're not really present for that. I, you you know, you kind of guess that, you know, but my experience with the book is not the reader's experience. Right. That, uh, that's everything, right? Because for me as an educator, you know, I've seen firsthand what books can do. Like I've, you may not have been able to experience being there while the child is reading your book, but I have, right? And that's to me the the best part of being an educator, of a literacy educator, is just seeing kids literally expand every time they read a book. Whether it's expanding their skills, right? Their decoding, their vocabulary, their comprehension. But what's more exciting is, like you said, it's the conversation that happens. It's the way they're thinking might be changed by a topic or, you know, it's it's thinking of the courage test or an exit 13 that they're thinking about people might change as a result as well. And when they can just expand their, their ideas of the world and how it works, that's to me, that's, that's books. Like that's the power. That's why I'm here. That's why, you know, I'm, I'm dealing books to kids. Like, like I can't get enough of it. Um, because I see that I, I get to see that power. And I think hearing you just say that you don't made me appreciate, you know, how much mm-hmm. I can't just sit with a kid and read right. a book and really see that, that transformation. That's I'm, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm feeling what, what's, the, I don't know what the word is, but what is it? Maybe I've taken that feeling for granted. And now I'm mm-hmm. realizing that that is a really cool place to be able to live. Well, I had a, I had a, uh, I interviewed Ann Braden recently who wrote yes, uh, the I benefits of that. being an octopus and she's I'm super cool. Favorite. And, uh, and I started by saying like, what do you, you know, she's a former middle school school teacher. And I was like, so what do you, what do you like about those kids? And cause when I meet teachers, you know, I, you hear two comments. One is like, Oh my God, I could never do middle school. Like it's just so right. messy, you know, like, and they just couldn't deal with all of that. And prefer younger or older, and um, and then there's the teachers who love those middle schoolers, and and I love their uh, a, a plastic quality, like they're not hardened into a mold quite yet, you know, like they're still formless in some ways and still open and flexible and you know, the world of possibilities is all so there, all at the same time in the same, you know, chaotic moment. But they, you know, these are kids that you can really um, impact and really make a difference with. And it's just an exciting time. And they're, and they're open and they're, you know, their identity is a theory, is a theme that um, runs through a lot of my books I, I I've kind of come to realize like that who am I you know just your first question right <laughs> who am I and and they're you know they're working that out right in that moment and it's just exciting when you can open a book and, and what a book can do in terms of that conversation absolutely and you mentioned your your interview with Ann Braden Tell tell listeners about the five questions. Like you, that's the series. <laughs> you love that series. Thank you. Um, I've interviewed my first job at Scholastic as a junior copywriter. Like I'd never been in an office before, other than my dad's insurance office, which I vacuumed <laughs> uh, on Sundays. But like, um, you know, my first job was to interview uh, Anne McGovern who had written a book called Shark Lady, and she was just a children's, and Ellen Comfort and Joanna Hurwitz. So these were like big people in the 80s. So I did these author interviews. And all my life, I have uh, continued on interviewing. I wrote uh, a couple of books for Scholastic Professional Books called, um, I don't know, with the big book of picture book authors and illustrators where I interview. And so I've interviewed, I got to, you know, hang out on the phone with James Marshall for an hour and all these other greats, you know, for years. And I just love it. And so part of me is that I love doing that. And I've continued that on my blog through, through years, I've interviewed people. And um, I also like to try to shine a light on you know, other people in my industry and in, in books. And, you know, I don't have the, you know, the brightest 
bulb out there. But, um, you know, I like to celebrate, you know, the talent and the books that are out there. So I, I've done it in different ways. And then recently I hit on this uh, five questions format, which isn't overwhelming for, you know, you're asking when I interview someone, I'm asking for someone to give up a fair amount of their time and effort and energy to do this. So I, I used to do ones that were much longer and took a lot of my time and their time. So now I'm, I'm kind of refined it to five questions. And it seems like once a month or every three weeks or two weeks I'm doing, um, I write to different people and say, no deadlines. <laughs> you know, I don't want you to stress about this. Let's do this for it's because it's fun. And the other thing about, uh, so that's on my blog at jamespuller.com. And you can, you can, I think there's a way you can sign up that you get an email if it, if it comes and uh, it's really cool. I just did Alicia D. Williams uh, the other day, talked to her, and it was first, she's just amazing and fascinating. But um, yeah, so I don't know. I, I was I had another thought, but I lost it. It'll, I'll, <laughs> well, those, it'll those come to me at like three in the morning, and I'll yes, I'll that's, give that's you a always stuff. I got yeah, it. I remember you. now what I was going to say. That <gasps> profound thing. Are you the kind of person that has the notebook and the you know the sticky notes of the pencil? by your bed for when that happens because that's always when I remember everything and it is annoying <laughs> yeah you know I used to think that uh you know I when I'm when a book is going well I have ideas in the shower you know because and that's a sign that you know just because like it's just in your head and you're yep. constantly thinking of new things and um so I even bought one of those things you can write in the shower, you can stape it on. I it, saw it, that <laughs> recently, yes. I thought, you know, and then of course the ideas just stopped, you know. <laughs> um, and it was dumb and and I I didn't, I'm sorry, I'm not endorsing the product. But yeah, I, I do that. And unfortunately now it's my phone, it's the notes app on the phone yeah. that I that I use. So it, I, it's unfortunate that I'm grabbing for my phone more than a notebook, but yeah. Uh, that's the fact. It gets the job done, right? Yeah. But I don't believe, you know, I do believe that good ideas will endure. I mean, I've heard a lot, of, you know, it makes some sense where they say, if you don't, you know, if you don't capture it, it'll be gone forever. But I kind of think those ideas have a way of working themselves back to you. It may not be the phrase, you may lose a phrase or something. And yes, you know, if you can write down that idea, but I'm not as afraid of like, some genius thing is going to happen and never return. I sort of feel like it'll, I'll work it out and it'll come back in, in an interesting way. I like that. I like that. So thinking about future books, so Exit 13, like brand new, like brand spanking yeah. new. Just came out comes out tomorrow. Book. It comes oh, out tomorrow. Okay. okay. Officially. So it's Tomorrow's the pub day. My... Yay. Yeah. That's yeah. exciting. So you mentioned working on another project too. You have you have more in the works. Yeah. Well, I I actually, you know, the pandemic was hard. You know, in terms of the industry and in terms of yeah. you know publishers are trying to figure out what they want and who they want and how many books they can tie. You know, so I had a you know a challenging time with that. But I just sold. Um, two ready to read books uh to oh, simon and schuster so it's not really known yet but um just and i love you know really when you talk about your work as a reading specialist i kind of some of the earliest books that i published um one is called uh, wake me in spring about a bear and a mouse and a you know hello reader with scholastic and hiccups for elephant and i love that those first books that an emergent reader can have success with. Yes. And um, so I love, I'm really proud of those two books. So of course, and both of them sold over a million copies, very successful. So of course I never wrote another, you know, for, <laughs> or, you know, I had some trouble and, and, and just kind of went in another direction, but I just sold two of those. Uh, so I'm excited for that next year. Um, not even sure what the title is going to be. I forget my editor's name. It's all very new. So we're getting the uh, first I'm, scoop. I like it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, and it's got a moose, you know, so who doesn't love a moose? That's right. That's right. And um, the other the book I'm, I'm 
I have a work in project progress, which is a novel, which is taking me a long time. Uh, I'm, I'm not a meet your deadlines kind of writer. <laughs> I mean, it, for certain projects I am and other projects when I don't have to meet my deadline, I, I sometimes don't. And um, I've got this story of a seventh grade girl uh, who is a soccer star who's effort and identity and focus and friendships are all revolve around the sport. So then um, she suffers a pretty significant concussion and mm -hmm. has that taken away from her. So again, it's identity. It's who am I, who am I, but I've been meeting with therapists and doctors and, you know, just figuring out this book. Cause a lot of times you have an idea for a book, but then you realize I'm not smart enough to write this book. Uh, I'm going to need help. You know, I got to learn a lot. So I'm, you know, right. I'm reading about anxiety and seventh grade girls and um, right. all of this other stuff. So um, I'm taking my time with this book and doing it slowly. And I, I did, I wrote this book, uh, Blood Mountain, which is a brother and a sister lost and a dog lost in the wilderness it's a wilderness survival book all the reviews compared it to hatchet and um it hasn't really gotten a lot of traction out in the world but um it's a riveting you know they're lost in the mountains for six days and the book's broken into different days but there was so much i had to learn you know like okay you have an idea and then you're like oh my god you know why do people get lost what mistakes do they make what happens when they're lost what how to what and i wanted also like to show like that people would be looking for them you know i think it's important for readers to know that like all the massive efforts that would be going on in the search grid and the this and right. um so that becomes part of the story it's probably i'm probably my proudest book but um but just the, i i was late by a year for that one and <laughs> just because it took that time you know and right I think it's okay. And all anyone remembers, no one reads a book and go, eh, the book wasn't that good, but he nailed that deadline. You know, <laughs> you, just, you know, you want the book is what we remember, you know, so you want a satisfying book. And oh, so you know, that's going on a sticky note on on my wall because <laughs> I have an over obsession with deadlines that can get me too anxious. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna have those words right there. You're right. No one, <laughs> no one will remember that. <laughs> Now, you know what the, the oh. sticky note I have on my computer or on my wall now is, um, you know, because there's so much about the business and and all this that's, you know, it's full of heartbreak and disappointment and frustration and all of that. And my um, my sticky note is, if you don't like it, write better. And that's <laughs> kind of, you know... <laughs> You just can't focus on all that other stuff. You know, you can only control what you can control. And, you know, I do the best work I can. I love that. That is a good way to, to wrap up. I, I love that. Can you, not that I don't whine. I mean, yeah. we can get, together, we can get together sometime and I'll just complain for half an hour, but. Well, and it's my hope that we'll get together again, because this summer I will be teaching children's literature and I will be able to bring Exit 13 into my syllabus. That's my favorite part of the summer is teaching that children's literature class where for 12 weeks, a group of teachers and I just read kids books all mm. summer long. So I'll definitely be bugging you back, back at that point when we're reading Exit 13 uh, later. Yeah. Well, thank you. It'd be an honor to... Uh... To connect with teachers. I'm always, you know, as a writer, I'm always envious of teachers because they have the stories uh, in front of them. But I'm also so aware that, you know, I owe my career to teachers, you know, to teachers who, uh, to the sharers and the influencers who, who, you know, press books in kids' hands and go, you know, and read not as the end user, but read as somebody who, who's like, oh, this is a book for Samantha. She's going to, this is, I'm, um, I'm going to, I can't wait to share this with her. And I know that teachers have done that with my books and I'm just very grateful for that. So I'm very aware and cognizant of the role that teachers have played in my career. And um, anytime I can talk to them, I'd be happy to do so. 
Well, wonderful. I will, I'm definitely holding you to that. <laughs> Thank you so much. I know you mentioned uh, your website. Is jamespillard.com the best place to find you if, if listeners want to take a closer look? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, I've, it, I've kept that website going for like 15 years and there's, yeah. there's actually a lot of good stuff on there. Um, you know, if you dig around, but um, there's that and you can contact me. I do school visits. I depend on school visits as an important way for me to survive. Um, you know, just critical, you know, <laughs> surviving is not an easy thing, uh, you know, in this business and, and the school visits are an important part of that. And I love getting in front of real readers and uh, hopefully, you know, celebrating books and reading and maybe leaving that school like a tiny bit better place than when I first arrived. Yeah. Best part of the job. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on today and, and celebrating my own love with children's literature. And I'm so excited that hopefully listeners will learn about a few books they haven't heard of um, and we'll go take a look at them and pick them up. So thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. It's really nice spending time with you. Thanks for listening to today's episode of the Get Literate Podcast. You'll find links to all the books, resources, and ideas mentioned in the show notes and at alitlife.com. And if you want more, you might like to join my Patreon community. There, you'll find additional inspiration for your reading and writing lives, like bonus podcast episodes, book calendars, monthly book clubs, notebooking challenges, live events, giveaways, and much more. It's only $5 a month, and you get instant access to all the previous content, too. You can learn more at getliterate.co. But one more thing. If you love what you listen to today, please take a moment to rate and review the podcast or take a screenshot of the episode and text it to a friend. This helps the podcast grow and builds our bookish and notebookish community too. Thanks so much for listening.